This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by TheGreatCourses.com, where you can watch or listen to thousands of lectures from top professors and experts. Get up to 80% off select classes by visiting TheGreatCourses.com slash galaxy. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 179 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Amazon.com TV series, The Man in the High Castle, based on the Hugo Award winning novel by Philip K. Dick. And this topic was suggested by listener Oliver Bayliss, so thank you, Oliver, for the idea. And this will involve spoilers for the novel The Man in the High Castle, as well as season one of the TV show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by two guests. So first up, we've got Laura Miller. In 1995, she co-founded Salon.com and worked as an editor and staff writer there for 20 years. For two years, she wrote the last word column in the New York Times Book Review, and she's currently the books and culture columnist for Slate. She's also the editor of the Salon.com Reader's Guide to Contemporary Authors and the memoir The Magician's Book, A Skeptic's Adventures in Narnia. So, Laura, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. And also joining us today is John Kessel. He's the author of such novels as Good News from Outer Space and Corrupting Dr. Nice, and such short story collections as The Pure Product and The Bomb Plan for Financial Independence. Together with James Patrick Kelly, he edited the anthologies Rewired, Kafkaesque, Feeling Very Strange, and The Secret History of Science Fiction. And he also teaches literature and creative writing at North Carolina State University. So, John, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. And today's show is brought to you by The Great Courses. Watch or listen to thousands of lectures on over 500 subjects. Each course is taught by top professors and leading experts from the most respected institutions in the world. And our featured course this week is called Your Deceptive Mind, A Scientific Guide to Critical Thinking Skills. If you've read any Philip K. Dick stories, you'll understand that being able to figure out what's real and what isn't can be really, really important. While scientific skepticism and critical thinking are the most important tools we have for separating the real from the imaginary, and the 24 lectures in Your Deceptive Mind cover everything from logical fallacies to cognitive biases to email scams, the course is taught by Dr. Stephen Novella, an assistant professor of neurology at the Yale School of Medicine. He's also the host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. And as you might guess from the names of our respective shows, he and I are on the same page about a lot of things. So give his podcast a look. And if you like what you hear, think about checking out his online class, which covers similar ground in a much more structured and focused way. And The Great Courses is giving our listeners a special limited time offer. Eight of their courses, including Your Deceptive Mind, are available now at up to 80% off their regular price. To take advantage of this special offer, go to thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. That's thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. Don't forget, go to thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. Okay, so let's start out and talk about the book, The Man in the High Castle. So Laura, let's start with you and have you just tell us a bit about how you first came to read the book. Uh, well... Philip K. Dick was really in the air at the time that I read this, and I basically heard about him because people were talking about Blade Runner and about Total Recall, um, some movies that were based on his stories. And I, it turned out that I had all these friends who were fans of his. I had never heard of him before. And I think that nowadays, that is how most people find out about him from recommendations from friends who are, who are fans. So um, I said, what should I read first? And everyone said The Man in the High Castle. So was that like Jonathan Lethem and people like that were your friends? Or? Uh, it was somebody else, but, um, but, but he was definitely one of them. There was somebody else who persuaded me to read it, but, <laughs> uh, but he was definitely one of the people I knew who were, reading, who, who were fans. So The Man in the High Castle was your first ever Philip K. Dick thing that you read? Yes, definitely. And so what were your initial impressions of it? Well, I was at first a little surprised that it didn't have the kind of big sort of existential or cosmic reversals that I had expected from from seeing Blade Runner or or um 
Total Recall. It, it, not except at the very end, but the beginning of it, or the most of the novel, is a bit like a, a literary novel in that it's mostly about the moods that people have, the subtleties of their interactions with each other, the details of the world that they inhabit, and it doesn't have a ton of adventure in it. Um, and so, in a way, for someone like me who primarily reads literary fiction and then kind of dips into genres every once in a while, it was really the perfect introduction because it's a very, you know, sort of beautiful, mournful novel with really complex characters who are, who were really interesting to me, as opposed to just kind of, a, you know, one mind-blowing thing after another. So it was really a great entree for me. Right. Like when you hear that the novel is about, you know, the Nazis won World War II, you expect it to be crazy action and violence and stuff like that. And it's not really that at all. It's, it's like you say, it's much more quiet. Yeah, it's really about living as, uh, as Dick put it in describing some of his choices to a friend. It's about living as a defeated people, which is something that Americans are just not used to thinking about, except maybe if they're in the South. And so, um, so, you know, it was, it's really just a look at the psychology of that, which is, is kind of alien to the whole, the very idea of being American. And that was really fascinating to me. Culturally, it's just such an astute novel. Yeah. Well, so John, why don't you tell us about how did you first come to read Man in the High Castle? Well, I came uh, up uh, uh, through the world of science fiction geekdom. I, I really was a, a stone science fiction reader as a kid from the earliest days. And so I was reading the science fiction magazines in the in the early '60s, and and uh, had read some of Dick's stories in Galaxy and other places, and then uh, the novel was out. I was only like 12 when it came out, and and uh, but I I it wasn't right away that I read it, but it won the Hugo Award, and so I heard about it and I read it, and I was really uh, taken with it, even though I was quite young. I I uh, what Laura talks about, I thought was fascinating, the way it presents this world. Uh, on the on the surface, it ought to be sensationally different from our own, and it is, but also how it does it so quietly and doesn't resort to um, lots of uh, you know hugger mugger and and uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know a, a, a complicated. I mean, it actually has a a, a kind of buried uh, 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 sort of uh, thriller plot or espionage plot, but it's really not about the you know the resistance to the awful. Nazis and Japanese, um, and so I, I really was taken with it. I also liked the. Uh, I was, con you know, I was, it was interesting to me that um, as a young reader, you know, I'd read a lot of science fiction where you pretty much have a good sense of who the black hats and the white hats are, and uh, Dick's novel sort of confused that. I mean, you you really don't. Uh, and there's a moral complexity there. It was really, uh, you know, I was not someone who read a lot of literary fiction. I was just a kid, so. Uh, it was an introduction to me to the idea that characters could be, you know, sympathetic, but wrong or right, but unsympathetic, both. <laughs> and that was really interesting to me. Yeah. So, I mean, were you involved in science fiction fandom at the time? Were you talking to other people who were discussing the book and things like that? It was it was some years before I was into fandom. I didn't really hit fandom until I turned 18 or thereabouts. So that's when I really, uh, you know, I would talk to other people about it. But then, you know, at the, in the science fiction world of that time, it wasn't spoken of. I mean, Phil Kiddick wasn't the person that he is today, you know, and that in the sense that no one he was an obscure writer. And and uh, I mean, science fiction, he was it was known, but he was if you would name the uh, the top five science fiction writers of 1968, Phil K. Dick would not have been on the list if you were among science fiction fans. You know, it would have been Heinlein and Bradbury and Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, and and so his reputation as it exists today is something that really is posthumous. It came to him after after Blade Runner, really. So when you first read The Man in the High Castle, did you did it initially hit you? This is one of my top 10 favorite books of all time. Or was that something that only developed? Uh, upon reflection later? I remember I really liked it a lot. And, and it wasn't till later that I really did cement this book in my top five, really. Uh, it is one of my top five favorite science fiction novels. So, uh, so uh, you know, I guess I wasn't really um, thinking too much along those, those lines at that point. I remember I liked it. Now, there were lots of other things I liked as well so, at that time. Mm-hmm. 
Well, so Laura, so in you, you wrote a review of Man in the High Castle, and you talked a little bit about the background of this book, how it came to exist. Could you talk a little bit about that? Just where did this book come from? Well, um, Dick was in this sort of weird place where he'd been very frustrated by the progress of his literary career. He'd been trying to write more conventional literary fiction, and that wasn't working very well for him. And he uh, had gone to work at his his wife had started this jewelry company, which is one of the reasons why uh, making jewelry is like <laughs> a big feature in the plot is because he had actual experience of that, which he put in he put in the novel. And then he just was driving up to this cabin where he rode in Point Reyes, and and he just got the idea of this the character who in in some ways is sort of the closest to a hero that the book has, which is um, a Japanese um, trade official, you know, just kind of a basically the bureaucrat of the occupying power, which is not who you would expect to have as your hero in this story, just as you would expect there to be a resistance. And there really isn't one. And the main people of conscience in the, in the novel are, you know, a dissident Nazi and, and, um, and, and the Japanese. Um, but it, it was also heavily affected by the release of some, documents from the Nazi era and they were these papers were at the University of California at Berkeley and he had gone and read them and had become extremely preoccupied with this sort of uh, intensity of the evil of the Nazi regime and that really affected the way that the the sort of moral poles of the story are not are, are really the Japanese and the Nazis and, and how the Japanese are, are sort of humane and people that you can live under, whereas the Nazis are basically going to destroy the whole world. Right. And I mean, I understand that he relied on the I Ching pretty heavily yes, when composing he did. this book. Could you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. He, he was very interested in, um, I guess you could say, esoteric western philosophy and also eastern spirituality or eastern culture so he he was particularly fascinated by the i ching he and his wife made a lot of decisions in their life after consulting the i ching as do the characters in the novel they are either trying to figure out if something that they're going to do is going to be successful or actually making decisions about what to do. And they uh, they throw the I Ching and they collect the hexagrams and they decide what to do based on that. And while he was writing the novel, every time one of the characters would cast a hexagram, he would do that himself. And he claimed that he decided what direction the novel would go in from the results that he got. And so, so John, I mean, so I think that this premise of kind of the Nazis victorious these days is a pretty familiar premise. Right. How common was that in science fiction at, when this book came out? Was that something fairly new or was it an established trope back then? Uh, it was not an established trope. There was a story by uh, uh, C.M. Cornbluth that was really quite a good story called Two Dooms that came out in the 1950s. It's a, he's a writer who's little known now, and I think he deserves rediscovery, actually. He died relatively young. I think he was like 38 years old. But uh, uh, but no, this was not a, a common idea. So I think the book had, had, a, uh, you know, had one of those uh, uh, premises that I think a lot of people were interested in right away. There had been another uh, alternate history novel that was pretty popular in science fiction circles called Bring the Jubilee, which has the other great alternate history premise, which is the South Winds of Civil War. And those two books were the only ones I knew about at that time that I'd heard about. And uh, there also is a book actually written by a woman named Catherine Budikin, a British writer called Swastika Night. But that was written in like 1939 while the Nazis were still in power, which suggests a, a, a world after uh, the Nazis have, have won the war. Um, at any rate, uh, so it was a, 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 it had some sizzle to it, this idea. And, and, you know, I confess that when I picked the book up, I did think it was going to be a lot about the resistance. One of the things that I know we'll get to the TV show, one of the things that sort of disappointed me was the degree to which they 
they you know, came up with that when it's not in the book. Uh, so I think uh, Dick actually, you know, it's really uh, quite remarkable, frankly, that he didn't choose to go that way, since it seems to be your your classic science fiction writer writing for pulp magazines or science fiction audience would, I think, uh, uh, have gone that way, have looked for that that angle, and Dick didn't. I think probably as a result of his, you know, he wrote ten non science fiction novels in the nineteen fifties that he couldn't sell, and I think some of that is carried over into this book, this sort of desire to present everyday life in contemporary America just happens not to be our contemporary America. <laughs> and also part of the of his interest in the I Ching and in Asian culture is that it is about this idea of acceptance or patience and accommodation, which you know, it just sounds like such an anathema to like the story of your homeland being occupied. But that is, you know, if you look at the I Ching, that is a consistent theme that comes up in it, is how can you accept this and kind of flow around it to to find a more balanced life, rather than how do you fight? You know, how do you just fight, fight, fight the circumstances of your life, which is more of a traditional adventure Approach. Right. It, it uh, sort of uh, uh, ties into Taoism, which I think Dick was interested yeah. in, and uh, the whole idea that opposites are just opposite sides of the same thing, and uh, the yin and yang, and, and uh, um, you know, how how uh, opposition is really uh, not the way, you know, water, it'd be like water, you know, flow, flow <laughs> into, the, into yeah. the, the low spaces. Well, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so let's talk about the TV show. So, John, so when you heard that they're turning this very contemplative sort of novel into a TV series. What was your reaction to that? I actually had heard that Ridley Scott was interested in this for years and years, and I had been waiting desperately to see someone do it. Uh, I thought always that it would make a better TV series than it would uh, a movie, because it's too complicated for a movie. Uh, so I was really uh, you know, highly uh, uh, eager to see it. And uh, uh, I was hoping that they would, you know, just uh, really give us Dick's novel as much as they could. I know they had to make changes. And, and so uh, I was, uh, my first reaction was actually quite uh, uh, n negative, frankly, uh, because uh, they did change so many things. And, and uh, they did, especially the, the idea that they uh, really did invest in the idea of a resistance movement against the Nazis and, you know, people going on missions and and you know uh ambushing uh ss people in automobiles in new york city and things like that and 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 also it seemed to me that it altered the nature of a lot of the characters uh so you know joe cinadella who's a, oh there's lots of spoilers here okay joe who's <laughs> a who's a, a nazi assassin uh you know who pretends to be italian uh shows up as joe blake all american boy uh, in the, in the TV show. And, um, uh, but then I actually, as I watched it, I, I, once I sort of said to myself, okay, they're just taking Dick's premise here and they're using some of his characters, but they're going in their own way, own direction. I, I sort of let go of that desire to see Dick's novel exactly on the screen, which is not what you get with the, the TV show. But uh, it does, does seem to me that they do, and they've read the novel, whoever wrote, writing the scripts and, and Frank Spotnitz or whoever, and, and they seem to me to understand some of the things that make the novel good. And so uh, some of those things creep into the story, even if it's not plotted the same way. Yeah, I mean, John, you, when you wrote about the show on Facebook, uh, someone commented and said that he had heard that Amazon wouldn't let them do the show without the resistance plot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, corroborate that, but I, I would certainly believe that. But it, it does suggest that maybe they had a different uh, conception of the show to start out with and kind of what ended up on the screen. Right. I think, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, what I thought they were doing when I first saw the first couple episodes was this is Red Dawn with Nazis instead of commies. Uh, and uh, thankfully, they, they get away from that. And so there are some some moments that are really very... Uh, uh, haunting i mean they do a real good job with i i think the 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 sort of embedded alterations to the world uh so there's a point where joe and juliana go into a deserted theater in colorado 
and on the walls a poster for a Marx Brothers movie, like Night at the Opera or something like that, and someone has scrawled over it, uh, Semites. And it's just in the background of detail, but not, not, nothing's made of it. And, and that kind of thing appeals to me a great deal. Uh, I thought, so they put some thought into that sort of thing. Yeah, this is a, a show that the strength is kind of all in the, the world building or the, the set design or the, the mise en scène. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how things look, uh, how things are photographed. There's this incredible care to the visual field. And so in a weird way, the thing that, that I thought of when I thought of how could this have been better was to, to have done something a little bit more like Mad Men, where the, the look and the feel of the life is so meticulously reproduced. And then you sort of have these people go through these ordinary events. Obviously, you know, it, it would be really hard to make a commercial entertainment about an occupied United States that where there wasn't some kind of resistance to it. So that's, you know, the, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like there's almost no way that this could have been made into a really great act or faithful reproduction of, of Dick's book, because it's just goes so much against what we want to believe America is like and is all about. And I think it would be repudiated. Um, but it does in the sort of really high level production design element of it, it is satisfying to that degree. It does actually have also, it surprised me in some of the later episodes. There's one episode where, um, Mr. Children, Mr. Children finally shows up, which is great because oh, you know I, yeah. I was I was like worried that he was completely cut out of the series. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, Me too. <laughs> but anyway, he goes to dinner with Paul and Betty Kasura, which is a scene right out of the novel, and they basically reproduce the dialogue there, where he he is trying to basically suck up to them to to uh, impress them with his civilization and how he's adapted to Japanese customs. And, and they're all about being American. So they're serving hamburgers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, uh, and in the course of the conversation, he basically uh, proves himself to be a, a racist, a very shallow person who who really doesn't have any soul. And, and that's exactly what happens in the novel. And I thought it was really and it's not really a very plotty scene. Okay, so there it is. Uh, I thought that that was really well done, uh, that they, they seemed to understand that that was important to the story. Here you have a character who is sort of morally fraught, his, his situation is, and you can understand why he wants to uh, be accepted and, and uh, to, to be admired, but at the same time, he's at, at heart really doesn't believe the Japanese are as... as uh, you know, racially equal to him. And so so that's a, a, a very interesting character. Well, he does. He, I would argue that he does and he doesn't. Sometimes he thinks that the Japanese are better than right. Westerners. And then when they don't accept him, then he decides that they're not. You know, I mean, it's a it's a really complex character. And and I agree, John, that that scene is probably the best one in the in the series and definitely the closest to Dick's conception of this character. And, and I think he's sort of emblematic of the average American under this regime. But, um, but I mean, there are just things that a novel can do that a dramatic production cannot, whether it's on the stage or on the screen or on television. And that is give you the sort of constantly shifting inner life of somebody like that where he is hoping to be accepted and then realizing that he made a mistake and not right, right. trying to figure out what the mistake was. I mean, because also he, his native culture is treated as this sort of charming, little quaint curiosity by these Japanese collectors who collect all of this Americana. And that is such a, you know, such a really amazing reversal of the usual relationship of, uh, of the Americans to whatever nation we might happen to be occupying. You know, they 
they like American culture, but in this sort of slightly condescending way. That, right. That right there, like, yeah, that's exactly right, Laura. I, uh, I would call them, they're Occidentalists. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, you know, they have this sort of uh, slightly simplified and, and prettified vision of America, you know, with six guns and, and Western posters and, and uh, uh, baseball and, 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 uh, uh, you know, I, that really is done nicely. Yeah. Also, I, I thought one thing they did also, which I, I hope they will, if they continue the series, pick up on is this question of authenticity. Uh, uh, it comes up with regard to uh, these two Zippo lighters. That's also right out of the book that, that Mr. Uh, What's well, actually Children has in the movie or in the TV show. Not it's not him in the in the book. But at any rate, uh, the question of uh, you know where does uh, authenticity lie or what is the value of something? Is it inherent in the object itself, in its uh, uh, historicity? You know its its associations, or is it all in in the head? Uh, and of course, in a story like this, where uh, so much of reality is a matter of perception. Uh, and it gets to be more so as the story goes on. I, I think that's a fundamental idea that uh, I, I think that they they understand, and I hope that they will continue to, to work with. Well, yeah, and I, I definitely agree with you guys that the scene of children going to dinner is one of the more memorable scenes from the show. And I mean, some of the other really memorable scenes, I think, are where they take some innocuous-seeming setup, and then this shocking darkness comes into it. So, I mean, you have the scene where the um john smith character is giving his son uh, life lessons but it's made very unnerving by the fact that they're wearing nazi outfits and then the scene where uh the local small town sheriff helps joe fix his tire right and it's made really disturbing by you know the fact that there's this ash falling from the sky from the nearby hospital um i don't do you guys agree that those are the scenes that stick out in your mind or are there other are there other scenes that stick out in your mind from the show those are are great and the thing that you'll you'll notice about picking out those scenes is that none of them involve the characters who are ostensibly the main characters who are people who are just kind of boring and very obscurely motivated like the square-jawed hero that you know, John Smith, or he's not really a hero, he's sort of a spy, or, you know, what he's really, like, why is he doing any of the things that he's doing? And then Juliana, you know... You're talking about Joe Blake, right? The, the Yeah, Nazi Joe Blake, agent. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Joe Blake. I, yeah, I'm sorry. He, I keep thinking his name is John Smith, but, but because that's the name of the Nazi Obergruppenführer. <laughs> um, and they're, both of their names are just so generic that it's... Um, but yes, Joe Blake. Joe Blake, um, what is going on with that character? I mean, he's so central to the narrative, and yet what is motivating him or what he actually thinks? It's completely incoherent. I, I uh, uh, agree about Joe and Juliana in particular that uh, it's hard for me to figure out what their motivations are uh, I, because, uh, you know, they seem to be... Uh, doing things more for the sake of the plot at times rather than for the sake of any internal motivations. I Actually, but Joe becomes a more interesting character to me as it goes along in that, you know, he does show some of the conflict that, uh, that you might expect uh, from the novel uh, of someone who, who is doing things that he doesn't really like having to do, but he's doing them also sometimes with great uh, verve and, and, uh, dedication and so uh, uh that to me is is interesting although i do think there's a little bit of incoherence in those characters whereas the, the joe smith character uh is interesting because he doesn't exist at all in the novel he's a the over group and uh ss officer uh and yet there are some wonderful scenes that come out of his his side of the story that i think are uh very very uh, uh haunting and so the the scenes with his son in particular uh, and later when he discovers his son has a, uh, a genetic disorder that is fatal, uh, which means basically in this world that he needs to be exterminated. Uh, I thought that was a really very telling uh, a moment, which they seem to forget about <laughs> pretty quickly. Uh, I, I assume that they'll take it up at some point later, but that was interesting to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that he is definitely one of the most interesting characters in the series, partly because they aren't trying to take characters who Dick conceived of as being essentially pretty passive and turn them into active characters. You know, they, they're sort of freed to create this guy, and, and then they just really run with the idea that he feels the same way about fascism that, you know, your sort of typical middle American, you know, Ward Cleaver type guy feels about Americanism. And so, um, you know, he, like they're really doing something interesting with um, picking out the ways that the the sort of idealized, wholesome, you know, controlled notion of normal family life is something that both Nazism and your sort of classic you know, mom and apple pie Americanism have in common. Well, there's something I, I, I read an interview with the showrunner, uh, Frank Spotsnitz, and he said something really interesting where he had gone on a tour in East Germany of this former Stasi dungeon. And of course, it's it's horrible. But he said there was someone else on the tour who had been a little girl while all that was going on. And she said, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know this was going on. And I kind of missed those days because there was order and there was always enough food and you didn't have to worry about having a job and things like that. And he said it was important to him to portray the fact that some people were attached to these kind of systems. Yeah. Right. That, uh, uh, that it, it, you know, uh, he built the Autobahn. Okay. That was uh, the line that... Uh, it provided you know. stability in a world that felt really unstable and frightening. Right. And, and if you had any, uh, you know, sense of uh, what, there needs to be a racial order to the world, then uh, that certainly gives you something to... Uh, an easy way to understand how that that works, you know. I'm I'm glad that John Smith, who seemed to, to me in, in the early episodes to be sort of a, the mustache twirling, you know, uh, villain, uh, becomes more complex. Although he certainly is villainous in his way as well. I, I was uh, I think one thing that they did with the TV show, and it may be the nest, the nature of such uh, episodic television, is that they seem to load up a lot of plots into the thing to just keep things uh, going. So they have cliffhangers all the time and mysteries and and thrilling elements. So that, for instance, the uh, Rudolf Wegener, who in the book is, uh, you know, a, a kind of apostate Nazi who's trying to prevent an atomic war between the the Germans and the Japanese. So he's basically selling out the plan to uh, get it to the Japanese uh, government. Uh, somehow gets in the in the TV show enlisted into a plot to assassinate Hitler, and you know that uh, to me, I, you know, in some ways I could see how that might be an interesting storyline, but it seems to me they didn't invest very much into it, and this sort of thing fizzles out in the end in a way that seemed very in, 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 inconclusive and not not very convincing. It seemed like that element was just put in so that they could bring us to Hitler and show us that in this narrative, he's the man in the high castle and he's the one who's actually collecting all of these films. And, and, you know, then you sort of wonder, well, is there some kind of, you know, is there another man? I guess. Right. Right. The way that there is in the book. And, um, you know, it, at least this assassination storyline takes us there because he still does give the secrets to the Japanese. Right, it is true. No, they do do have that happen. They have it happen actually very early in the in the series. So his his function after that is, I guess, taken up with all this uh, this other stuff. Yeah, um, you know, in the book, actually, Hitler is not even in the book. He's gone. Uh, yeah, and Martin Bormann is the Führer in the book, which uh, is interesting because I saw some criticism of this of the series saying, oh, well, you know, Dick didn't understand that Hitler was uh, enfeebled by the end of the war and could never have been the Fuhrer in 1962. <laughs> when in fact, Dick knew that. And, and uh, but the TV people, I think, you know, quite understandably needed to have Hitler in there. I think there is meant to be another man in the high castle because I saw Frank Spotnitz say that initially this was only a four episode thing when they were trying to get it made for the sci-fi channel and that you and that you met the man in the high castle in episode right. four or something. And he says that, I mean, he has this planned out as a 10, 10 season thing. And he says wow. there are lots of things from the book that haven't made it into the show yet. So I would imagine that that's one of them. 
you know, I, I got the impression from watching all of these 10 episodes that, that they would keep circling around to things from the book that might show up in odd places where you wouldn't expect them, but there they are. Uh, suddenly, you know, a window opens up and here you are in, in you know, in the dinner scene with Paul and Betty Kasura. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, although I've sort of been harsh on it, I, I'm, I think it's quite interesting and I'm, I'm interested in seeing more of it. And I just have to forget about Dick's novel a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's it's pretty clear that the plot of this has virtually nothing to do with the novel. But we've all said that the the world building and the visual world in this is what's so striking about it. Is that how um, faithful to the novel is that? Like, how much did they just take straight out of the novel, and how much did they come up with on their own? I don't think it's in the novel that much. I mean, the novel is very much about. Um, conversations and people's internal state it doesn't have a lot of description in it i think that's right there there are maybe some some moments where we're in the streets uh outside the japanese trade ministry of san francisco and we see the you know uh, a different kind of san francisco but you're you're right i think the and this is the great power of, of visual media is to really let us see these things and it's very impressive the way they show the topography of San Francisco, I mean, the, the hills are all the same and some of the buildings are the same, but other things are, uh, you know, they were bombed out and, and rebuilt by the Japanese in an entirely different uh, uh, style and, and way. That, that I think is very, uh, that's very convincing, you know, and, and actually in the little scene they had where Wegener goes to Berlin to, uh, to uh, 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 pursue this assassination plot. Uh, you know, the buildings that are there in Berlin are ones that Albert Speer uh, had designed for the post-war Berlin when they make going to make it the, you know, the great architectural capital of the world. And there they are. Uh, these are uh, they, you know, CGI these buildings into Berlin, which I thought was very interesting. What do you guys make of them changing the, the grasshopper lies heavy from a book to a series of film reels? I thought it was a little absurd if he wanted to spread some kind of Samistat propaganda, and especially because in the movie, the film is extremely illegal and difficult to get, and people are chasing around after it. And so in the, in the book, because it's a book and it's mostly legal. I mean, it's legal in the Pacific states. And so people just go into a hotel bookstore and buy it. But the thing about a book is that you can hand it around, you can read it here and there, you know, you can slip it to someone easily and then they can read it somewhere else. With this, it's, it's, there is something a little absurd about a, a piece of, you know, prohibited, um, you know, culture or whatever that you have to actually find a projector and, and a screen and a dark room in order to, see it and also there's the the sort of mystique about the films that oh you know what are the how did these come to be what is what are they filming here i thought we you know lost the war but these images say that we won the war and so uh you know it's it's really not the same sort of thing at all as a book i don't know i mean i i, I can see you know that's an interesting trope I don't know, you know, uh, I, fe I felt definitely the loss of the book because the, the book was something that everyone was talking about throughout the whole uh, novel. And uh, you could actually have, well, of course, that kind of discursive discussion of what the world would have been like had the Allies won uh, and the politics of it, uh, it would, would not go over, I think, in a, you know, a movie or a TV show. So I can see that. But but it does seem that the, to me, that the film idea is kind of unwieldy. And it, it doesn't, it's, it's murky in a way that the book is not. Well, the one thing that it does do is it pushes forward a more of an action storyline because when the Juliana character sees it, she doesn't just see someone proposing a different history. She sees actual images from a different history, which makes her think that she can get to that different history. So she keeps saying there's a way out, there's a way out, which is not, what is happening when it's a book. With a book, it's clearly someone's imagination, the work of someone's imagination. But because she's seen this film, it's like she thinks that there's 
another place that she can get to where life is different. And that seems to be confirmed, another spoiler alert, by the very last image of the series, which is actually out of the book, which is that Mr. Tagami suddenly finds himself in a, a version of San Francisco where the Allies did win the war, and he is the minority. And um, all of the signs are suddenly in English, and you don't, you know, that's where it stops there. That's like the last image. But in 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 the book, there's just this brief moment where he seems to sort of s slip through a hole in time and wind up in the American version of San Francisco, and then kind of slip out of it again. Right. I, I thought that that was actually a good place to end the the series. Uh, you know, assuming there's going to be a continuation. Uh, um, I, I one of the things that that you know in the in the book, it's very clear that the re, the thing that enables or causes Mr. Tagomi to slip from his version of reality to our world is uh, his sort of meditating upon this piece of jewelry that was made by Frank. Uh, and he doesn't know that it was made by Frank, but he, it comes to him. Uh, actually, in the book, comes to him mis through Mister Childen. But uh, uh, and then there's another scene in the in the book, which is again sent. It's probably the most violent action scene in the book, where a bunch of Nazi uh, agents uh, who are undercover break into the trade ministry to try to assassinate Mister uh, Wagner and and, uh, and Togomi and this. Japanese general who are having a meeting and uh Mr. Tagomi uses this civil war pistol that he bought from uh from Mr. Childen uh which was a, a fake uh to to defend them and and it, he man he kills the the agents who are breaking in and and does save them but the the sort of horror of having to shoot these men dead in his his office uh, uh, kind of unhinges him. Uh, what what I liked about that in the book is it's very cleverly done so that both of these objects, which in some ways are central to Mr. Takomi's change of of heart and mind, came from Frank. Uh, the gun does, and the jewelry does. Uh, one saves his physical life. One essentially saves his emotional life. I teach this book all the time <laughs> at the university, so I think about this a lot. And and then the other thing that happens right after that. Is Frank has uh, been arrested, uh, and they've discovered he's Jewish, and they're going to ship him back to the East Coast, where he'll be exterminated. And uh, Mr. Tagomi has to sign off on the extradition papers, and uh, their papers are handed to him, and he's he's in the process of having an argument with the German uh, uh, consul, and uh, uh, he gets so pissed off, he just uh, says, "I refused. Okay, I'm not going to send this guy off." He doesn't even know whose papers they are. And what I like about that is this sort of very, very kind of Taoist or I Ching kind of thing where Frank's, the two objects that Frank made, one of which was a fake, but actually works, a fake pistol that works, and a piece of jewelry which has no meaning other than what it is, essentially save Mr. Tagomi. And then Mr. Tagomi turns around and saves Frank without even knowing who Frank is. And Frank and Mr. Tagomi in the book never meet. They don't even know each other's names. And so... Uh, uh, there's a kind of symmetry to that is so beautiful that is a, a I think it's a coup of plotting, frankly, as a writer. And and it, and it, it it always astonishes me that he's able to do this so subtly because you can read this book ten times and never notice that. Sorry to go on about it, but it's something that has always intrigued me. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I was curious, John, like when you say you teach this book in class, how do students in 2015 react to the Man in the High Castle? Uh, they tend to like it. Uh, they do. I think a lot of them are uh, surprised and maybe some disappointed that it's not uh, Red Dawn with Nazis. Uh, you know, they're 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 looking for that. But uh, but once we get into some of the subtleties of the character and the complexities of it, I mean, it's a lit class, so you know, I think that at least they ought to be prepared to talk about such things. Uh, that then I think they they come to appreciate it. So, Laura, so what are you hoping to see from the show in season two? And is there anything from the book that hasn't appeared yet that you're hoping to see? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm curious to see what the other man in the high castle is. But, I mean, my guess is that it's going to turn into something like a two-universe storyline where the characters, 
move back and forth, kind of like um, kind of like Fringe, um, where there are the characters are able to move between alternate universes where there are their counterparts are are different sorts of people. And um, that is just, to me, a, a little bit less interesting than exploring the world of the man in the high castle. Um, you know, what is life like? We, we sort of have a sense of what life is like for sort of regular people in the Pacific states. But everyone that we've seen, or almost everyone we've seen in the Nazi-occupied part of the U.S., is an official of some kind. So we don't know what it's like for a barber living in Boston or a farmer in Georgia. Or, you know, we don't really know what has happened to African Americans. Yeah. You know, there are some in the series, but we don't, like, what is their situation in both the Pacific states? There's a, a little mention of it in, in the movie, but, you know, there, I, I, I mean, my colleague, Julia Turner, uh, in the Slate Culture Gab Fest, said, uh, pointed out that there's this weird paradox where all of the characters are trying to get out of the world of the series to the world, let's just say, that we live in, um, when, in fact, the world of the series is the whole reason why you're watching the series. So you're really at odds with the characters, you know. They want to come into this world and we want to as the viewers want to stay in their world and just see more of it mm -hmm. that that is very interesting yeah i i actually think at this point for me i just sort of let go of the book more and more and 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 like to see uh what they could do uh if they take seriously the premise and 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 imagine and they have spent some time imagining what everyday life is like there and i want i want to see I don't know what their plot is going to be. I guess it will be trying to find the other man in the high castle. But I, I do think that uh, uh, you know, there's a, there are a lot of interesting things I could do. Certainly, the issue of race would be worth looking into. Okay, uh, uh, you know, Dick makes it pretty clear that black people are are either exterminated or are slaves, and and or worse uh, in in the world. And I and yet we, you know, he doesn't show that. And I think that the series has the opportunity you know i wonder if someone could go to go to georgia or north carolina uh, and and show us what what it's like there yeah i did see frank spot and it said that he wanted the first season to be focused on san francisco and uh new york and that he thought he said in future seasons you would see other countries and what was going on in the wider world of this this universe See, I saw that Philip K. Dick tried to write a sequel to Man in the High Castle. I was just curious if you guys knew anything about that. I know that he supposedly did, but I don't, I, I'm not aware that it, it really exists. Did he write, um, I should know this, did he write a chapter of it? Um, and it turned into another story or something like I that? Don't, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to, I should know this when I don't, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I think there were like two chapters from it that showed up in one of the books that was published after he died. I think that's right. I believe that's right. Yeah, but but it did it didn't go any farther than that. And I think there was one of his novels. I was just reading about this. Now I'm blanking. I think it might have been Radio Free Albemuth that started out as a Man in the High Castle sequel, but he ended up changing the premise so much as he wrote it that by the time it was done, it had nothing to do with Man in the High Castle anymore. Well, also, I mean, we haven't even talked about what the end of the book, The Man in the uh, Castle, yeah. is, which is basically that the, you know, Juliana confronts the author of of the book. The grasshopper. That is the, yeah. yeah, the grasshopper. Yeah. What is the grasshopper? Lies heavy. Is hev lies heavy. Lies heavy, yeah. And, um, and she somehow has divined that he used the I Ching to write the book, and so they cast a hexagram to find out why and the hexagram tells them that the book is true and at which point it seems like they all have accepted the fact that they are fictional characters i mean so it's, it's an ambiguous ending it's very enigmatic and also the alternate history of the triumphant allies in the grasshopper lies heavy is not actually the history that we the readers of the book have lived it's a different version of history in which the allies won 
I, I very much like that about the grasshopper who lies heavy in the, the novel described in the novel, uh, in that it is not our history at all. In fact, it turns into a kind of nightmare history of its own, uh, uh, between a, with a, a conflict between the, the U.S. and Great Britain, the British Empire. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, I mean, so that there's a suggestion there that there's an infinite series of possible histories there that you might have had there uh, that would have would have come out of this. I just think the end of the book is is really ambiguous, and at the end, after Juliana throws a hexagram after he's met she's met uh, Hawthorne Robinson, the man who wrote the book, uh, the Grasshopper Lies Heavy. Uh, she goes leaves his home and goes back into the city. I think it's Denver or someplace like that, and and uh, you don't know what city she's going to and what it, what reality it is that she's returning to. I think that that. Dick himself always complained that he he didn't like the ending of the novel, but I don't I don't know that it's that I don't think it's a novel that can give you a conclusive ending. I I think he he came up with a, a pretty good ending given the circumstances. What another thing that I really love about that ending is the man in the high castle is built up into this like strange and sort of wizard like figure who lives in this sort of fortress redoubt, and then when she shows up. He lives in a suburban house, and they're having a cocktail party. I was like, it's like my parents, you know? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there's just a bunch of people yeah. drinking wine and kind of chatting, and it's there's no wall. or I just thought that I find that hilarious and wonderful. Right. I think that that's one of Dick's things he does is is to to sort of play against the expectations of a of a genre audience or a pulp audience. Uh, so I I don't know if. Uh, when we see the man in the high castle, it will be very interesting to see how how he appears in uh, in the in the series. I was wondering, John, if you could just say a little bit about the legacy of Man in the High Castle. I mentioned earlier that Nazis won the war. Fiction has become kind of a, its whole industry. Like, what do you think has been the influence of Man in the High Castle on on all that kind of stuff? Well, I think that uh, 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 I guess there's a book called Fatherland, right? And there's a uh, oh, that's I, a great book by Robert it? Harris. Yeah, and then. Uh, SSGB is a Len Dighton novel, which I haven't read. Uh, so I know that there is a, a you know, a, a, a kind of that kind of uh, aftermath. Uh, and I think that that, uh, you know, has a that's sort of just taking the premise and, and playing with it. Most of those things, I think, don't tend to have a very um, subtle approach. Uh, but I think what the Dick's Dick's effect has actually been on a generation or two of writers who uh, like me, really were affected by this idea that you can create a future or history or uh, extrapolation that uh, is inhabited by real uh, uh, dense, uh, you know, human beings, and, and not necessarily resort to a, a kind of uh, extremes that um, science fiction is is associated with. So someone like Kim Stanley Robinson, for instance, I think, well, he wrote a, uh, his dissertation was the novels of Phil K. Dick. I don't know if you've read that book, but it's a wonderful book. And, uh, you know, I think his fiction is, is uh, steeped in, in, in Dick's work. And of course the, the young writers that he knew when he was living in, uh, in his last decade, uh, Tim Powers and uh, James Blaylock and K.W. Jeter, I think were directly influenced by the things he did, and people like 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 me. I mean, I I actually tried to write a story. I did write a story that, where I threw the I Ching in order to plot the story. It's one of my favorite stories. Uh, so I never would have thought of that if I hadn't heard of Philip K. Dick. Um, I think you know his influence is is large in, on written science fiction, and of course it's amazing how it's been in films. I mean, I think there must be a dozen films now based on Philip K. Dick novels or stories far more than any other uh, published science fiction writer. Uh, he sort of become the go-to guy for your weird science fiction notion. Um, and uh, sometimes I think, well, there's a lot of other writers out there, you know, Dick is great, but check out Alfred Bester, you know. And there are also these sort of pseudo Philip K. Dick storylines where they're basically a Philip K. Dick storyline that somebody else has sort of, or a device that, that is very Dickian that they have, um, that they, that somebody else has borrowed, like the Matrix or the Truman right. Show, um, you know, 
That's right. That's right. Uh, this uh, idea that isn't really too much in the Man in the High Castle that I think Laura was referring to at the beginning of uh, what's called the reality breakdown, where you're established in a world that seems to be completely uh, rational and, and ordinary, and then something happens to pull the rug out from under you, and it turns out everything is not what it seems. Uh, it's an illusion, or it's a play, it's a it's a plot, it's a drug dream, it's something other than what it seems to be, and you've been living in it your whole life. I mean, do you guys want to say anything about this was this show was made by Amazon.com, and I saw a lot of science fiction people saying that they never thought to see something like this, a Man in the High Castle adaptation on this scale with this budget, and uh, I saw Frank Spotnitz say that this never would have ha if, if Amazon.com hadn't gotten into the TV business, this never would have been made because no other network would have done something this risky and spent so much money on it. I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts about Amazon getting into the TV business and will we see more kind of out there science fiction properties as a result of that? Well, I don't think that's really true that that only Amazon, there's something peculiar to Amazon that would have have um, made them the only possible producers for this. But because there's also Netflix, um, which is a lot of adventurous original productions. And um, and so many cable productions are now, you know, really pushing the envelope. I mean, it's part of the whole golden age of, of television thing. And what Amazon certainly does do is provide yet another outlet yet another competitor for content. So um, if there's a good idea, it's that much more likely to find its way into a production because of all of these alternate means of production. I do think that, actually, I have a conflict of interest here because my wife, Teresa Ann Fowler, uh, wrote a novel called uh, Z about Zelda Fitzgerald, which is a pilot's just been made it's shown and right now of by amazon <laughs> for a tv <laughs> series based on her book so i guess i know a little bit about how amazon works i think one thing that amazon's trying to do is is they are trying to go a little bit outside the envelope on some of these things that are not not what ordinary people do so z for instance is a it's a half hour dramatic series i have never heard of a half hour dramatic series yeah. uh and and it's uh uh it's unusual and so i think they're willing to bankroll some things that are not what uh certainly not what a network would do but also what even some of the cable uh producers would not uh easily okay green light and so uh I do think this is the golden age of television, and and uh, Amazon, um, whatever we may think about Amazon, it does seem to, at least at this point, be willing to put a lot of money into a lot of different things, very different things. Uh, some of them work and some don't. Well, it's interesting because you say Amazon has this interesting program where they create lots of pilots and essentially let the audience vote on which ones they like the best. And I think I think The Man in the High Castle was the most favorably received pilot of anything they've ever done. And the series is currently 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, notwithstanding our kind of mixed review of it. But, I mean, it, it seems like there is a, a, a an appetite among the general public for this kind of science fiction show. Right. Well, and I, I have to say, I have to commend Amazon and Spotnitz and everyone else involved in this to have invested so much time and effort and thought into it. I, You know, I may have my my questions about exactly how they're doing it, but uh, I'm engaged and I, and I think it offers uh, opportunities for really intriguing things that I've not seen before in a TV series. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing the next season. I hope that uh, they'll take all my advice here and <laughs> straighten out and fly right. All right. Well, I think that, that's a good note to end on and we're all out of time here. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Laura Miller and John Kessel. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, really. It's fun. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Laura Miller and John Kessel for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Jamie Lord in the UK, who writes, One of the best podcasts around. David effortlessly and consistently delivers an insightful discussion that's sure to entertain any nerd. The quality of this podcast's production is simply astounding. Keep up the great work. 
So big thanks again to Jamie Lord for that great review. And of course, a special thank you to Martin Carlberg, Ryan Met, and Gerard Hines, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's show, The Great Courses. Remember that if you do decide to purchase one of their courses, you should head on over to thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.